There's been a lot of things that have been going on behind the scenes here on After Prison Show, and today is going to be a day of full disclosure, or at least as much disclosure as I know at this point. The things that you're going to hear about in this video aren't going to be easy to hear. They're not going to be good things. In fact, there really is nothing good about this video. However, I want to be completely truthful with all of you and let you know first and foremost, I made a major mistake. But it's not just me who made a mistake. It's other people who are involved with After Prison Show who made a mistake as well. Yanni and probably most certainly Big Dave also. Before I begin to give you the backstory of what all of this video is going to contain, I want to say one thing first and foremost. With After Prison Show and everything that I try to do with this channel, I try to promote as much positivity and inspiration as I possibly can for those who are out there struggling with anything especially for those who are struggling after incarceration, coming home after prison, and trying to readjust themselves back out here into society. The unfortunate reality of that is, in some cases, some people just struggle a lot more than others. And that is a lot of what you're going to be hearing about here today. The backstory to all of this is that on Tuesday, Yanni and I went and filmed the video with Big Dave, where we were giving him the proceeds raised from the GoFundMe that I created for him. And at that time, we had raised $1,250 to try to help Big Dave adjust back out here into the free world and hopefully hold him over until he was able to find a job for himself. Now, after GoFundMe took its cut, it ended up being $1,186.55, all of which we ended up giving to Big Dave. Yanni and I had a major conversation, hell, we had multiple conversations about what exactly to do with this money. Were we doing the right thing, giving him all of this money at one time, this lump sum of over $1,000, or should we just spoon feed this grown man a little bit of money here and there? I ultimately made the decision to just go ahead and give him all of this money, trusting that he would do the right thing like he told me time and time again on Tuesday in the video that we shot with him that he was going to do with it. However, at this point, it seems like that is in all likelihood not the case at all. And it's because of that that yesterday, while I still had a lot of questions about what exactly was going on, and believe me, this story gets a heck of a lot crazier than just what I'm mentioning thus far, but it was because of these thoughts that I was having that I went ahead and deactivated the GoFundMe campaign so that no more donations would be coming in for that. And with me doing so, if my assumptions were proved to be correct, then I was going to go ahead and refund everybody who donated to that campaign all of the money that was donated. And what I'm about to read you right now is an email that I received from GoFundMe this morning after I emailed them saying, I deactivated this campaign by accident. And the reason I felt like I did so was because I didn't have everybody's information who donated. And I was asking them if they could help me refund everybody their money because of what I ultimately feel has happened since we've given Big Dave this lump sum of money. This is their response after I emailed them. They said, good morning, Joe. I'm sorry to hear about what happened with Dave. I went ahead and reactivated the campaign in order to issue refunds. If you'd like us to issue refunds on our end, this will be a better option because if you personally refund, you'll be refunding the payment processing fees as well. If we refund on our end, we will only recover the amount sent to your account and donors will still get 100% of their refunds back. Please note that if we issue refunds, this process cannot be reversed and all donors will receive their money within three to seven business days. Just to confirm, is this the campaign you'd like us to refund help for Big Dave? Since you've already withdrawn the funds from that campaign, our payment processor, WePay, will need to manually recover $1,335.55 from your account in order to issue refunds. Can you confirm that you have significant money available in this bank account and that you'd like us to begin the process of recovering it out now? This can take 10 days to complete and once the funds have returned to your payment account, we will refund to your donors. Because of the large balance in your account, our escalated support team will assist you once we hear back from you. So please allow some extra time for their team to respond to you again. Looking forward to your reply. 
I've gone ahead and given the okay for this money to be refunded and it says that it should take about three to seven days for that to happen. Now here is the story of why I went ahead and decided to go ahead and deactivate the GoFundMe campaign and why I wanted to issue these refunds. Again, it was Tuesday when Yanni and I went to film with Big Dave where we gave him the money. However, the very next day, Dave's phone was cut off all day long. I couldn't get in touch with him at all. But the story gets a lot crazier than that. And the reason it does is because not only could I not get in contact with Big Dave, I also couldn't get in contact with Yanni. It was when I couldn't get in contact with Yanni and then I couldn't get in contact with Big Dave that I began to worry and wonder and question what the hell was actually going on. It was then when I deactivated the campaign, fearing the worst that these two were together and potentially both relapsing. I spent all day Wednesday not being able to get in contact with Yanni nor Big Dave. And in fact, it wasn't until Wednesday evening when I was finally able to get in contact with Yanni that he confirmed some suspicions and some worries and some questions that I had that were just almost impossible to hear. Yanni admitted to me that yesterday he relapsed. But when I was first getting in contact with Yanni yesterday, the very first question I asked him after he told me that that's what had happened, I asked if he was with Big Dave and he assured me that he was not. He said he hadn't seen Big Dave since Tuesday evening when he went to drop him off. And since then, nobody has been able to get in contact with Big Dave. Today is Thursday and Big Dave's phone is still off. There is a lot more to this. And I felt the only way that I could tell this story fully is by having Yanni tell his side of this. And I'm gonna allow him to do so. So I've got Yanni here with me right now, and I just need to say a few things first and foremost. Yesterday, Yanni, I couldn't get in contact with you at all. Uh, you told me you had to go pay court fines and that you were going to be a little late. And then from there on, I didn't hear from you. And I called and I called and I called. And then you sent me a pretty uh, coded little message, I guess, where you said that uh, you were your mom, you were in the hospital, and that you would call me, uh, you were acting like your mother, saying that Yanni's in the hospital and I'll call you when I know something concrete. And then I called immediately after I got that message, no answer, but it was once I received that message around one o'clock, that was when I started to piece everything together and really feel like uh, something was wrong. And I finally got in contact with you last night after I called your father and he hadn't heard from you. And you came clean. You told me that you relapsed yesterday and you told me also that you weren't with Big Dave, and I didn't believe you when you first told me this. I thought that the two of you were together. Since talking with you for about almost an hour and a half, two hours this morning, I do believe sincerely that you weren't with Big Dave. I just found it ironic that his phone was off, and I couldn't get in contact with you. Uh, it just, it wasn't making a lot of sense. But again, I spoke with you for like two hours this morning. Uh, and I was ready to fire you. I mean, I told you you were fired. I told you that you let yourself down. I told you you let me down. I told you you let after prison show down. And I mean, I was pissed. And, and you know I was mad. Um, but then I asked you to tell me the entire story of what happened yesterday. What happened from Tuesday when you dropped off Big Dave until when I was talking with you or until you began to text me yesterday. Um, and it was after I heard this story I began to relate, I began to relate more. I've been there, I've done these things, and I began to realize that I, I, I didn't want to just give up on you. However, being completely honest, I did also give you an ultimatum. I said, you know, I really want you to come and be clean uh, and completely transparent with After Prison Show. Tell us what, the, what happened. Um, and that was kind of the ultimatum I gave you. And I know this is not going to be easy for you to do to admit these things. You've been wearing your pajamas for a day now. 
And I'm not going to sit here and ridicule you. I'm not going to sit here and belittle you. I'm going to allow you to tell the same story that you told to me from what happened Tuesday after we got done filming with Big Dave, after I gave him all of that money up until this point. So you just want me to start from the top? Just from there. Start um, from when we left on Tuesday when you were going to drop off Big Dave. Okay. Uh, so we, we, we had one more uh, shot that we needed to get an interview. Uh, a two shot with you and, and Dave. And, uh, you know, sort of give his testimonial and sort of sum up you know, the, the concept and the idea of, you know, helping people out after prison and how it impacted him. And, um, and then you had to, you know, you had to take care of, you know, some responsibilities. And so I took Dave home. Um, so we left. And so the next thing that happened after that, we went to 7-Eleven. He said he needed a ride to the store. And uh, so I took him. I took him to 7-Eleven. And he came out with, and and I guess this has been documented before, but, you know, I went through a, a pretty hardcore bout of, uh, you know, al alcoholism. It led to me, um, it led to me, I, it, there was a certain pattern. There was a certain thing that I sort of drank when I got off of work, uh, something that worked for me, for where I needed to be. And, um... And then it would just sort of go on from there. And there was a certain type of drink, right? And so Dave, I take him to 7-Eleven. He says he wants to grab a couple of drinks. And I'm assuming he's just going to get a, um, I don't know, an energy drink, a Coke, candy bar, I don't know, something. Something something along those lines. Snacks, um, soda, whatever. And he comes back into the car. I don't even go into the store. He comes back in the car with four of these club tail drinks, lemon, lemon drop club tails now which is like beer it is well yeah yeah well and then some it's 10 percent alcohol and that's kind of what i would do i would what you know i would grab a couple of these things after work and then i'd grab a couple of more and it just became kind of like my daily routine um i wouldn't really go so much go out so much and drink but but anyway we're getting we're getting we're getting beside the point he he he, he, he comes in the car with the with the alcohol and just immediately cracks it open. And I'm just like, what the hell are you doing, man? Why are you, wh where did you get the idea that it was cool to come to my car? You know, I've, I've only had my license for, for a month and I've only had a car for two weeks. Where did you get the idea that it was cool to, to just, just have an open container in my car? I mean, I didn't even know that you drank. Number one, I, we've been talking this, this entire time about your, you know, your sobriety. Um, so, I don't know. It just sent, sent a lot of mixed signals to me right then and there. I mean, I'm thinking to myself, one, does, what does it say about me that I'm projecting to this guy that it's okay to have an open container in my car? Yeah, I must be sending off the vibe that, like, this is totally cool behavior. I don't know. I mean, that's just kind of what was going through my mind at the time. Anyway, we left 7-Eleven. I'm like, no, you, you can't drink in the car. Um... And I don't know where you got the idea that that was okay. So I kind of I kind of drew a line in the sand right then and there. So I took him, but there was something about the smell. Like I have not smelled that smell in a long time. I mean, in almost two years. Now, when you refer to the smell, you're talking about the alcohol. It's not the alcohol. It's the smell of that alcohol. You know, that alcohol really has. I mean, if I smell a beer, I mean, of course, I go into Seven Eleven and I go to. Uh, you know, I go to sporting events. I mean, I go to play, you know, I go to wedding, whatever. I mean, I, I go to a lot of places where they have alcohol. That's not, but there is a distinctive smell to that particular, you know, brand drink. And, and that brings you back to a time where you said in the beginning, you said, you know, this would be the, uh, what you would start with. And then this would what, lead to other things? I mean, typically it would lead to more drinking. But yeah, I mean, it would, but it would lead to lots of drinking. I mean, lots of, you know, I just would drink to the point where... Um, where I would just, you know, pass out. I really couldn't go to sleep without it. I could not go to sleep without uh, that alcohol. So you get... It's very it's very strong. It's very potent. And, you know, a couple of them, and, you know, just... Yeah. So you take Big Dave to the store right after we get done filming, 
after the both of us had been sitting there having this huge debate, not only with just the two of us, but also with him. You know, it's crazy. I'm never going to put this video up. I may put parts of it up so you guys can see what I'm talking about, where we're telling him, look, we are trusting in you to do the right thing. And no sooner than we get done filming, after he's been talking to us till he's blue in the face that he will do the right thing, as soon as we get done filming, he asks you to go to the store. You take him to the store. He buys four of these uh, club tails. And then what happens from there? Yeah, so I, so I just take him home. I just take him home. He doesn't live far. It's probably a 15-minute drive. And he's unbelievably depressed. I mean, for a guy that didn't have anything at all, I just could not believe how... But I also had to keep in mind that, that he does have mental health issues. I mean, I, God knows the title of our original video was, you know, essentially mental health issues and how they affect people upon release from prison and, you know, sort of the resources that are available to them. But, I mean, he, he, he seemed like somebody had died. You know, looking back on it, it, it seems like, okay, he already made a decision in his mind to do something, and I, maybe he was trying to reconcile that with himself. I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know for sure. So I was like, well, look, man, what's, when, what's, what's going on? He said, well, my mom needs beer. You know, my mom needs beer. She keeps needing stuff for me, and it's just, can, can you give me a ride to the store, to Food Line, to get her some beer? So I'm like, Sure, why didn't we do this at 7-Eleven? But sure, there's a food line right by his house. That's what we do. Um, and uh, and then he asked me, can I help him with his... Uh, he wants a table and a chair. He's like, Yanni, I don't even have a table, man. I know you got a screw gun. Is there any way you can come over tomorrow and put this table together? And I'm like, I don't know about tomorrow. Maybe, but definitely Thursday. I'll come and help you put this put the table back together again. And, or put the table together, and then he had some other issue that he needed fixed uh, in the apartment. Um, While all of this is going on, are you at a point, or are you reaching a point, or thoughts in your mind at this point of you wanting to go do drugs? I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know if I could even, I don't know, I don't know. I mean, I definitely have like a really uneasy feeling. I don't know if I can articulate that it was, in fact... You know, so talk to me about when the troubles for you began. Well, you know, first it was like the start of the smell of the alcohol. I mean, that was definitely like a huge trigger for me. And then, it, and then I felt really bad because he's like, well, you, you just hang out and watch a movie with me. And I just didn't have time. I was exhausted. It was a really long day. It was a hard day. Um, things really just didn't work out. We had lots of technical problems. Uh, we had rain and all that sort of thing. It was just a long, 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 long day, and I was exhausted. I, I just, in my head, I was like, I just, I got, I need to get rid of Dave, and I need to go be by myself. That was really the main thing that was in my mind. I got to get everybody away from me. I got to get this guy out of my car, and I got to be with me. And he brought up a guy that we had been locked up with. Well, that's funny how this stuff goes. But a guy that we had been locked up with, he's like, well, this guy's been trying to get in touch with you. You know, you sent your friend request. I said, well, I don't, I don't, I didn't even know he was out of jail. So anyway, I look up the guy's profile on Facebook. I accept him as a friend. Um, and right there in the car, you know, he sends me a message, you know, hey, what are you, what are you getting into? What are you doing? You want anything? I got some killer dog food. I got that fire pow pow. Talking about heroin and cocaine. Yeah. Yeah. So he's sending you these messages, and, and then what? So I told Dave, look, man, I, I'm, not, I'm not up for the movie tonight. I'll take you another time. Um, and I drop him off. And, and there, there was another comment made. Uh, you know, I was saying something about Steel Reserve. Nah, nah, it doesn't matter. He had mentioned, hey, you want to go get a bottle of liquor? I'm like, a bottle of liquor? No, I don't want a bottle of liquor. This is what Big Dave is telling yeah. you. Yeah. So you're getting messages from this dude that you know who's locked, or who, who you know from being locked up. Obviously, you know, he's still involved in all the, all sorts of bad stuff. Yeah. And then where does this lead? Well, so it turns out that the, the, I dropped Dave off. The Where this guy lives and where I dropped Dave off, 
he lives like a mile and a half away. And it's on my way home. And he's just like, man, you got to come out here. Because I, I, I exchanged numbers with him, which is the first mistake. If I had never, you know, I never should have accepted the firm request. I probably, in the back of my mind, knew, you know, what the positive. Because I don't have any drug contacts on my phone. I don't have. I've The only way that I could stay sober is to completely eliminate. Because if I have, you know, because the, there's going to be moments when I'm, like, really tempted. And if it's just a phone call away, it's just too damn easy. So you're in contact with this guy, and obviously you end up going and meeting up with this guy. Yeah, so I went and spent, uh, I got a gram of Coke. I got a gram of cocaine. You know, he just kept going on and on about how great it was, and I just started thinking, man, the rush of, I, I mean, I've got to be honest with you. I mean, you know, if I, if I were to have a list of, like, the top five greatest feelings uh, I've ever experienced, you know, one of them would be the euphoria of an amazing, uh, you know, hit of cocaine. Um, there's nothing like it. You know, now there's everything else that goes along with it, but as far as, like, that initial thing, yeah, there's nothing like it. It's an amazing feeling. Um, and then, yeah. Yeah, so that's that was that was the thing, yeah. So that's what I did. That's what I did. I got up with him, and, uh, and I got a gram. And I waited. I waited because I knew, you know, I knew on the, on the ride home, I knew on the ride home, you know, I got the message that, you know, because look, I, if you guys don't know this, I mean, I do live with my parents now. I mean, I, I'm just, I'm only four and a half months out of jail and, uh, you know, I'm not in a position right now, although I, I am looking, I, I'm not in a position right now to be entirely self-sufficient. I mean, I take care of my own bills, I pay my own bills. But to save money, yeah, I live with my parents. And for structure, you know, I live with my parents. It's kind of embarrassing, but it, you know, it is what it is. Um, it works for me right now, today. It didn't work for me yesterday, but prior to that it has. And, uh, yeah, so that's what it is. So, you know, they told me, hey, look, we're going out to eat. You know, do you want us to bring, bring anything back for you? And, of course, I know, no, I mean, I'm not going to be hungry. But I know also I can't do anything around uh, I can't do anything around them for obvious reasons. Um, and I can't give the impression that I'm high around them for, for obvious reasons. One, it's a, you know, the place that I stay, you know, my life, my, my, my shelter depends on it. But also, I, I mean, I, oh man, I know immediately that I've done something really wrong. I mean, I've done something, I've, I've gone beyond the pale. But I also know, that I'm not strong enough to just throw it out the window, even though I know that I bought it and uh, I know I shouldn't have it. I'm not strong enough to throw it out, so I don't. I keep it. And now at this point, it becomes like a premeditated thing because I have it. Now I have to plan for it. So I go to the house, and but I'm not going to do anything while they're up. So I, you know, I wait for my I wait for my dad to go to sleep. You know, I run the shower. Uh, for about an hour and then I get into it and um and it lasts me for a couple of hours but my my dad knows that you know he knows he knows he can tell he can tell because generally when I do cocaine I don't do it like normal people do it you know I'm not a social user there was a time yeah sure 20 years ago yeah sure I'd go to a party go into the bathroom do a couple of lines and and uh you know chop it up but I'm at the point in my addiction where I am an isolated user. I don't like to use around people, and I prefer to be left alone. Um, so that's where I'm at with that. And so I locked myself in my room and got to it. And uh, so he not, you know, he he knocked while I was taking a shower because I was in there for a long time. You know, it's not normal for me to take 45 minute hour long showers. That kind of thing is usually a dead giveaway. Um, Your dad was knocking on the door. Yeah. So he was already getting the idea that something wasn't right. Yeah. And this was on Tuesday night. This was on the night after we, I mean, on the same day that we had just got done shooting the video with Big Dave. Uh, I, I want to say this, first of all, before you continue with this story, because... I, I just want to throw this in here. You know, 
I had filmed another video yesterday where I didn't have these answers that I do have now, and we don't even have all of the answers yet, as you'll continue to hear in this. But yesterday, I had this assumption that something wasn't right, that potentially you and Big Dave were together and you and him were spending this money and getting high together. Now that I know at least your side of this thing, and I can't emphasize enough how mad I was and ready to just kick you to the curb for this because of all of the implications that come behind this. But now that I have your side of the story, I feel more, I mean, I feel a sense of responsibility in this. You know, I'm always trying to be so careful and cautious with who I bring to After Prison Show, who I introduce to After Prison Show. But I know for a fact, or at least I feel like I definitely disregarded and neglected putting you in a position that could potentially be a trigger for you. You know, we're out here dealing with people who have addictions, and this is just probably not putting you in the best of positions. I know there's going to be a lot of people who are watching this who are disappointed in Yanni, who are probably pretty pissed off at him, as I was as well. But I hope that you will at least give him the consideration uh, to have the courage to sit here and tell his story. I want you to continue telling me the things that you were, or telling all of us the things that you told me this morning. From now we are in the house, you're doing what you're doing, your dad, he's got an idea of what's going on. Yeah, so, yeah, he does. He, yeah, he, he definitely, and, you know, yeah, so, I, yeah, so, I, yeah, he, he knows, he has an idea. He can't put his finger on it. He doesn't know exactly what I'm doing. I mean, they're not, he doesn't know exactly what I'm doing. But generally, and I was getting to this, if I do cocaine in the way that I do it, there, I don't, there's not a whole lot of jibber jabber. There's not a whole lot of talk. And my mouth gets so dry that, and I become so dehydrated that I really, honestly, like, like I have a very difficult time even speaking. So it becomes very obvious. If you know me and you know the way what you I'm act like on yeah. a normal basis, where everybody automatically already assumes that, you know, you do drugs. And that was something else that I wanted to mention in this as well. I know that probably, maybe not so much of a major contributing factor, but that's got to be a part of this as well. You know, the comments section from time to time, people will be like, you know, Yanni looks like he's on drugs. He acts like he's on drugs. But, you know, for as long as I've known you, that's just the way that you always act. You're high strung. You're 100 miles an hour all the time. And now you're saying, you know, when you are on these drugs, you're completely shut down. And, and that's how I used to be as well when I did these things. So I definitely relate to what you're saying about this. And this is probably a dead giveaway to your parents as well. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where people get the idea. I guess everybody reacts differently because their brain chemistry is a little bit different. But me being, yeah, like you said, naturally uh, very high strong, it actually, just like someone with ADHD taking an amphetamine, it sort of balances them out. Cocaine definitely doesn't balance me out. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that it shuts me down. It shuts me down. It shuts down my ability to speak. It shuts down my ability to communicate. And um, and what I am is what I'm doing. And that's it. It's just like on to the next meal because it's the only thing I'm interested in. So what you're saying is uh, this gram that you got, this wasn't it. This wasn't it. There was more that you did. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that... You know, I started that that around 9.30, and then uh, around about 12.30, 1 o'clock. Um, you know, I really drug it out. Number one, it's been a long time since I've done it. But number two, um, because I'm playing a little cat and mouse game throughout the house, this is pathetic, you know, me being the age that I am, that I'm, I'm dumb. This is something a 14-year-old kid would do. Uh, a really messed up 14-year-old kid. Uh, but I am get so paranoid <clears throat> that I'm, I'm just, I'm just like consumed with paranoia and I know that, you know, that, you know, that I, I mean, I know that he has a feeling, but I, that, that paranoia just goes up to the nth degree with, in conjunction with the drug and the fact that he has an inkling that something isn't right. Just like yesterday, you had a feeling that something wasn't right. You couldn't exactly specifically state or, or place exactly what it was, but you knew that something was wrong. And that, that's what it was with him. So, you know, and I, and I got to tell you, this, this, 
this guy, he's actually not my dad. He's my stepdad. He's been my stepdad for 33 years. Um, my parents, he, my mother got married when, remarried when, when I was seven. Um, but he's always treated me like, uh, like I was his own. Uh, he, he's always done that. He's probably the greatest uh, man I know. He has more integrity, more honesty, and uh, he's just a legit guy. Um, and so I know I'm letting them down. You know, I, I, you know, they let me come back and stay there when they said they wouldn't. Uh, you know, he helped take care of my bills when I when I ran out of money. I had a certain amount of money that I had uh, that I had made when I owned my own business, but that ran out. Uh, and then to keep my credit afloat, you know, he helped me with that. You know, he's giving me a place to stay. He's giving me the shirt off his back. You know, their 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 whole adage is always, "You look, you stay sober, you do the right thing, and you know we'll do whatever we can for you." And uh, so at that point, I'm feeling, "Well, wow, I can't even do that." And here I am. I've just come over with Joe. You know, he took a leap of faith with me, and I took one with him as well. But I can't even talk to him either because I I can't even I, I can't I, I can't even express like how I, I don't even know how to apologize for this I mean I don't, where do you begin I don't know where to begin so anyway he knows something's wrong and he wants me to spill it and I, I just of course I'm gonna deny it to the end I'm gonna deny it to the end you know I always like pride myself on being like this incredibly honest straightforward blunt guy that'll tell you anything at the drop of a hat and is always brutally honest but when I'm high, there is no there's no honesty. There's only evasion, hiding, lying, and and bullshit. That's it. That's all. That's all there is. And um, so I get to the end of it, and I think that they're sleeping. But I, you know, so I call up. I call them back, and I said, "Look, I can't leave. Can you deliver something? Because I've just not done yet." Now that I have a taste of it, I just, I gotta keep, I gotta keep, uh, keep going. And, uh, so yeah, that's sort of, I get an affirmative, brings it on over. So now he's periodically, I lock the door to my bedroom and he, because he's, he's come and opened it a couple of times. I generally leave my door unlocked. I don't ever lock my, my bedroom or anything just for, uh, I was where I'm looking for. I mean, just so everything's on the up and up. Like, there's no, there's no question. I don't want to leave a question that, that I'm doing anything that I'm trying to hide. I have nothing to hide. You know, everything is an open <coughs> book. So, but no, I, I locked the door. He's come in a couple of times. I'll figure it out later. But I'm locking it. And he tries to open the door. And he's like, Yanni, open the door. And this is throughout the night. This is late at night. Yeah. This is like two o'clock, three o'clock. Yeah, so uh, so I unlock the door. He's right there, you know, asking me a bunch of questions, kind of in my face, you know, what the what did you do? What did you do? You doing heroin? You doing cocaine? What the f are you doing? I mean, what what is going on? You know, look, you know, if you want to kill yourself, you know, you're not going to do it under my roof. You're not going to do it in front of me. You know, I don't want to see it. You know, you do that at least have the common decency and respect to do it outside of the house. And uh, you know, after everything that this person has done for me, you know, when I went to prison, I made canteen. You know, when, when I had when I had VIs on Saturday and Sunday, you know, I got a visit every week. Unless they were out of town, I had at least one visit every week, and that was from my parents. And this guy even came up to see me, and again, we're not blood relatives. Like, if my mom was out of town or she just didn't feel like coming or whatever, he was there. He would come by himself. Uh, you know, but again, when you're when I was when I'm high, if I'm into myself, all the way into myself, which is I mean, getting high is a very selfish thing to do, unless you can do it in a socially acceptable manner. I can't. I don't care. I I don't care. I don't care what you've done for me. I don't care how well you've done it. I don't care how much you love me. I don't care how much you care about me. I don't care how much I owe you, how much I'm in debt to you. 
all of that is irrelevant. It's just completely out the window. And so the only way for me at this point, now that I'm a couple hours, five hours, six hours into this, the only way that I can, the only way I can avoid feeling that, because it's going to hit me, like it's hit me now. The only way I can avoid feeling that is to do some more. The only way that I can avoid explaining the story to Joe and explaining the story to my parents and explaining my sister. I mean, she, she told me, you know, she, <laughs> I'm not going to read that text, but. The only way that I can avoid all of that, the only way that I can avoid dealing with the problems is to, is to keep doing it, is to just stay out there. I probably would have been done. I would have been done after about 100 bucks and a, a, 120 bucks and a couple of grams. That would have been it. But 7 o'clock rolls around. At about 5 o'clock, I go in the shower because I'm dying to get out of the room. I'm dying to get out of my bed and uh, because I just know he's like right on the other side of the door. I know he's right on the other side. I know he can listen to everything. And so I, I go back and I take another hour shower. Of course, I don't even get wet. I'm just in the shower. The water's running. And I'm getting hot. And uh, I get out. I'm trying to avoid him and my mom completely. And they actually brought this up. They're like, is this, is this, does this have anything to do with that Big Dave guy that you've been telling me about? Because I told them about what we were doing with APS. And they're adamantly opposed to anything prison related. Like, that's just, my parents are very conservative. That's how they are. You know, they don't, they, the idea of me hanging out with anybody I was locked up with or anybody in prison is just, how could you? They've only now started warming to the idea of me working for Joe. So seven o'clock in the morning, I got to get out of there. So I put, I've got my J, I've got my PJs on and, uh, and, uh, and I've got some slippers which are these right here. Okay, so in my head, I'm like, okay, I need some cigarettes. I'm just going to go get some smokes and a drink at the... And of course, I've got plenty of... You know, I'm Mr. Boy Scout. Anything that I would ever want to drink is at the house, but I'm, I'm trying to come up with any excuse in the world to, uh, to just get the hell out of there and go to the store. And I, in my head, I'm thinking, okay, if I can just go to the store and get 30 minutes, you know, just to sort of clear my head... Uh, you know, I'll figure it out. I'll get back to work. And, um, you know, the story with the fines is legit. Like, yeah, because you told me we were texting in the morning time. Uh, everything seemed normal. And then you texted me and said, I need to go pay these fines off. I'll be a little late. And I said, OK. And then that's when hours started going by where I wasn't hearing from you. And I was calling probably starting like around 10 o'clock. You weren't answering the phone. And I guess every hour that passed from there, I just began to get more and more suspicious. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, so now I get, I go to the store. I, you know, that's what I needed to do. I went to the store. Okay. But now, I gotta go back. And I, and then that was kind of the thing, like, what am I gonna deal with? What am I going to be facing? I didn't say anything to, and the, you know, the kind of family that we have, you know, if you go somewhere, you, you know, tell, you tell you somebody. Yeah. I don't give a, you don't give a damn how old you are. You don't just like walk out at seven o'clock in the morning with your six thirty in the morning with your PJs on, and and not say anything. But of course, I couldn't really speak. I didn't want to deal with it, so I just left. But 30, you know, 30 minutes wasn't enough. Uh, there wasn't enough. So I went over to a guy that I hadn't seen in a long time, just kind of like on a lark. Went over, uh, called the guy, and he, you know, he answered the phone. So then I'm thinking, okay, this is, this is actually what I did. I, I went and bought some alcohol. And then I went to the store. So when, you know, drinks weren't really drinks. And they ended, it ended up being alcohol. Because now I'm like, okay. I gotta get straight. I gotta figure this out. I gotta get straight because I, I need to get to work. I need to go pay some bills. You know, we've got a big day planned. And how the hell am I gonna cover up that I've been doing cocaine all night? Oh, I got it. I'll drink alcohol. Yeah. But here's the problem with the alcohol is I'm not real good at moderation. So now I get totally shit-faced drunk within an hour. 
hour and a half that any decision making any faculties that I had you know at my disposal at that point were because I already had like I already had the notion that you know it's already in my head that I'm doing coke like that's okay that barrier is like broken down right so so now I've now I'm drinking alcohol and you know and the reality is when I was texting you like Chesapeake was the only one that I actually had to go to to buy myself some time I told you that I had to go to Portsmouth as well but Portsmouth I was able to pay on the phone Chesapeake for whatever reason I guess it's because I've been on multiple payment plans with them I have to pay them in person uh, I don't know but I do have to pay them in person but Portsmouth I didn't have to pay in person and that's exactly where we were actually I think we talked about 7.30, 8 o'clock yeah. and I was in the middle of the midst of this uh, yeah so here I am playing chemist with my own body and I haven't done either one of these things in a very long time, whether it's, you know, cocaine, alcohol, but now I'm doing both. And I'm completely mixed up. So I go to this guy's house, and I'm like, I know he's a hardcore alcoholic. I go over there, I'm like, hey, man, I got, you know, I got a case of beer. You know, you, what's up? 7.30. This guy answers at 8 o'clock. Yeah, yeah, come on over. Not, the, not, not a guy you want. In the, uh, and I just I just knew this guy's phone number off heart or uh, yeah by heart. I, this is not a phone number that I had uh, in my phone. And uh, I, under in, under normal circumstances, like I wouldn't even remember this person's name, much less their phone number. I, I'd remember their name, but I mean, it was just one of those things. So now he's nagging the he's nagging the, the hell out of me. He's like, man, what, man, what have you been doing all night? And I was like, yeah, oh my god, man, I'm really, I'm really, you know, because at that point, no, even though I'm drinking, like I. I'm Cynthia enough to know that I'm that I mess. I mean, I I mess up bad, and I gotta fix it. And then he's like, "Man, man, no, man, no, look, I got the guy. You want some cocaine? I got the guy. I got the guy, man. He's right there. He's in fact, I got my roommate right here. He's got to take my brother over to this. Uh, it was it was a fucking it was a driver's improvement thing or something. Some kind of piece of paperwork or something for." A driver's class, driving class, at a Greenbrier uh, instructional, whatever. And I'm like, so wow, so he can leave. So if he leaves right now, he can go get it. And it's like it's like eight eight thirty at the time, and, and then I can still be back at ten. This is like this whole pretzel logic that's like working in my mind. Okay, if I do this, if he can get back here by nine o'clock, I can do, I can do another G, and then I'll be right by ten because now I'm drunk and I can't be drunk. I mean, first it was I couldn't be on co- I couldn't be I couldn't be on coke, and and be around my family or be at work, but now I I can't be drunk, so now in order for me not to be drunk, I need some more coke. That's what I'm thinking. So boom, that's what I'm doing. Uh, but of course, it never works out the way you want it to. Uh, what was nine o'clock turns into ten thirty, and then yeah, so. But then I got an even better idea. So 10.30 hits, run through that. I got an even better idea. And, and I'm sure some of you are asking, well, Jesus, if you're going to get high all night, why didn't you just get an eight ball? Or why didn't you get a quarter ounce? Because I never planned on doing more. Like, it was like, okay, I'm going to get this little bit amount, this, this, little, this little amount, and then that's going to be it. I'm just going to get this little amount, and that's going to be it. But it's the lie that you're telling yourself. Because not only are you trying to deceive everyone else, but the, the person you're really deceiving is yourself. This whole time, I'm practicing self-deception like it's, a, like it's high art. So now, I've got this at 10.30. Now, 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 now it's lunchtime. And the last time my folks knew, five hours before I left in my pajamas, and they've been calling you all day. Yeah, they called me a couple. Yeah, they called me. Yes, yeah, so they've been calling me. They've been trying to get in touch with me. You, you're trying to get in touch with me. They're trying to get in touch with me. And I just—it's overwhelming. I can't deal with it. I don't know what to say. I don't know. I just. Yeah. So I'm doing the same thing I'm doing with you. I, I'll I can send you a text, but I know that if I talk, the jig is up. Because you're going to be like, well, who is this guy? Because Joe's never been around me uh, high before. So believe me, if he heard me, if he heard me on cocaine, he'd 
he'd be like, yeah, can do me a favor, put Yanni on the phone. Who the hell is this guy? Because this is a completely, it's a completely different dude. Completely different dude. All right, so then, okay, uh, then, I, then I'm like, okay, well, I've already done this. Now, I, okay, look, if I can get it together by one, if I can just get it together by one, I can still salvage this. I can still salvage it. Um, so you know what I need to balance myself out? I need landing gear. You know, every airplane, no matter how high as it go, goes in the air, it needs landing gear. Well, the only landing gear I know for getting high is heroin. So. So you end up getting that. So I go out, the same guy that Dave turned me on to that I know from being locked up. I said, you know what, well, while I'm out here, I'll go ahead and get another gram of Coke. And my tolerance for heroin is non-existent. And I've had a lot of heroin overdoses. I'm because I'm just my body just isn't built for it. So I'm like, well, hey, you know, one stop shopping. I'll go ahead and get another grant. He's like, man, I still got that fire, pow pow. All right, all right, whatever. I go back to the ATM, pull out another seventy, get another gram of coke, get a half gram of dope. I figure that's gonna be. I don't even need a half gram, but I'm so messed up. I actually had to, you know, I had to have somebody else drive for me. I didn't feel, I was way too paranoid to drive. I didn't, uh, you know, I felt like the car was falling apart. Like I could hear like every little gear turn in the car. I thought the wheels were about to fall off the hubs. I mean, I was just convinced. I was like, what in the hell happened to this car, man? It was perfectly tight yesterday. And now it sounds like, it feels like a, like a, like an old wagon uh, car or something. I don't know. Like on a, I don't know. So, and then, so, the, and, and there we are. There we are with the, you know, that. But then, okay, so the guy beats me for the dope. He gives me the coke, says, park right here, give me the 50. I don't have the dope, but my, my buddy's got it, and it's fire. He never comes back. So he just completely disappears. He sends me a couple of texts, but I never, that's a dead issue. But now I have it in my head that I need to come down, and I've got to come down. So, you know, I go to another guy, pull another... 60 out and get some uh, and I got some dope but it just didn't you know I did it and it just didn't I find, finally you fast forward man we're, we're probably looking at at this point I don't know mid after probably late afternoon 5 or 6 o'clock at this point too much time has elapsed the day is shot I haven't been home in 12 hours You've called me a dozen times, and all I've done is send checks. And, and in order to like stave off, like to try and buy me some time, I even told Joe that I was in the hospital. Here, I'll. This is what I said. I said, "This is Yanni's mom. He's in the hospital. I know he'd want me to give you the heads up. I'll give you an update when I know something concrete." So this, I had the temerity. And the audacity to put this in there, like I'm over here on my deathbed, and then my last dying wish is, "Oh, mom, please let Joe know everything's, you know, if, if you don't talk to anybody else, you know, talk to Joe and let him know I'm okay." I mean, that is a real bullshit. I and mean, that's it, pathetic. It was as soon as I saw the text, I already knew what it was. I tried to call you back immediately, you didn't answer. So you spent all day yesterday. I mean, relapsing. Tuesday night is when it began. Do you do you go home last night? Because I even called your your father. I got to backtrack your address through Uber and then white pages, find the phone number. I call once, nobody answers. I call the second time, your father answers. And I'm talking to him, and, uh, I mean, he doesn't know what, where you're at, what's going on. But he says that you sent a text that you were going home, so you never even go home last night. So it was just continuous, more, more fucking up, basically. Yeah, I mean, I just couldn't. If I, if I knew I could go home, if I knew I could go home, and and I could just go. I mean, or if I knew if I could talk to Joe, and and I knew the outcome, like I knew exactly how it would work, and it would be short, and it'd be painless then I'd do it. What keeps me out there, and this is not to absolve myself of responsibility, is having to deal with it head on. 
and having to face up to my responsibilities and, and, and the consequences for, for my actions and having to deal with the pain and suffering that comes as a result of, you know, something I've done. And, uh, but no, I don't want to deal with that. I'm scared to deal with that. So I, really it's, it, you know, it's interesting at about eight or nine o'clock, I'm done. I'm really, I'm good. I'm good, but I don't want to explain it. I just don't want to explain it. And because I don't want to explain it, the only thing that'll put this off is just to keep going. And that's when I found out about Dave. That's when I got the tag. That's when I got the, that's when I got the messenger. That's when I got the message from Dave's ex-wife or baby's mama, whatever she is in Florida. She found me on Facebook and sent me a message through Messenger, through Facebook Messenger, and told me that Dave stays in constant contact with her. He hasn't contacted her in 24 hours. What's going on? And so for about an hour, hour and a half there, I'm like, okay, this is my opportunity here. This is my opportunity. I can save this guy. And in the process, sort of save myself. Like, I didn't know that there was a problem with Dave. I mean, I had a feeling that, you know, that, that no, I don't know. I, I don't know. I had a little hair stand up on the back of my neck because of that last encounter that we had. But Dave honestly was like the last thing on my mind until, because I, I mean, at that point I was sending you texts like, I'm going to call you. Like, I was serious about that. I was like, I'm going to call you in a minute. Just let me, let me get my shit together. I'm going to call you. I was dead serious about that. And I was pretty much back to normal. And then this whole Dave thing but you, yeah, But you never did call me. And I ended up going to sleep. There was nothing else I could do at that point uh, until I had the concrete answers that I got this morning from talking with you. I at least know what's been going on with you. I know there's going to be a lot of people who are watching this we're going to find it as ironic as I found it that, you know, all of this happens to you and we haven't had any contact with Dave in over a day now since giving him that money. Uh, I know it's going to sound ironic uh, that the two of you just in separate directions would seem that both of you relapse and God only knows where he's at right now, what he's doing, hence the reason why I had to completely shut down the GoFundMe and, and issue the refunds that I did. But... I need to say that I do sincerely believe Yanni with his forthcoming, as truthful as he's being, I mean, basically uh, sparing no detail in this situation. I do believe that he wasn't with Dave and that he, that he didn't know uh, what, what's going on with this guy. Me and you finally get in contact on the phone this morning. Uh, and when we do, it was not a pleasant phone call at all. I mean, I am ripping your head off. Uh, and I mean, I'm mad. I'm mad. I feel like you let down yourself, but I also feel like you let me down and especially let After Prison Show down and I'm, I'm, I'm just mad for a lot of reasons. I'm mad because of Dave. We don't know where Dave's at. I'm mad because I don't trust you. I don't believe what you're telling me. And then after we continue this phone call for as long as we do, I begin to relate because I've been in this situation in my past. Uh, the, the story that Yanni's talking about, being locked in your room at your parents' house, I mean, I've done these exact same things. I was ready to fire you. I wanted to fire. I told you two or three times you were fired. I said, there's no coming back from this. That's it. But, you know, you're pouring your heart out to me on the phone. You're crying. You know, the situation about your father really, it really reaches you. You know, uh, you know you've messed up and you messed up in a major way. I don't know what the outcome from this video is going to be. I don't know what the response to this video is going to be. All I know, and, and, and all day yesterday, I didn't even know how to move forward. We just did this video with Big Dave, giving him all of this money. I mean, and, and that just seems like the beginning of a disaster that pretty much is what this has become. You know, when you suffer and deal with addiction, I mean, you are going to go through times where you make big mistakes. Uh, I criticized Yanni, telling him that he was weak. I told him all sorts of things, but ultimately, I don't know what's going on inside of your head. You know, I don't, I don't know. 
I don't know the, the demons that you battle. I don't know how hard it is for you because I'm not you. You know, all I know is addiction is a monster that some people fight a lot harder than others. And there's no way I can sit here and honestly just say, Yanni, you're gone because of all of this. With all the positivity and all the good things I've tried to do with the After Prison Show, I mean, I owe it to you to at least give you a chance to try to, to, try to rebound from this, to try to get yourself back together. You're a guy that I know who has so much damn potential, and I tell you this all the time. You know, you have so much potential, and that's why I've wanted you in front of the camera. Just as good as you are behind the camera, you're that good in front of the camera. But at some point, you got to realize for yourself, man, like, this shit is gonna get you nowhere. You know, you're lucky you ain't die yesterday. You're lucky you ain't get locked up yesterday. You know, and then you got to deal with your parents. You still haven't even dealt with your parents. While we were on the phone, you went to your parents' house, and your mom told you she didn't even want you there. You need to come back when your dad's there, and then address that situation then. So you don't even know what's going to happen with that yet. But it takes... A lot of courage to sit up here and admit all of this that you've admitted. And that was the only thing that I felt could come from what's been going on. Is I wanted to be completely transparent with everybody who rocks with the After Prison Show. And a major part of that transparency is you sharing all of this shit that you've been up to. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't... Yeah, I mean, when it was when we were when we first talked about you know doing this, I thought, you know, because usually I just I'll I'll do anything. I have no I have no shame about anything. I'll do anything, anytime, anywhere. You know, put a you know put me on a stage or put me you know, get give me a camera and let's go. And then I thought about it and I was like, well, there's no way in hell I can do that. Absolutely not. I will not. It'll it, it destroy my credibility with. With your fans, uh, with the the APS Army, with any, I, I don't know. I don't know really how I come back from this. But then I was like, then I thought, there's if there's look if there's one or two people as tried as it sounds if there's one or two people that can relate to this because not everybody gets through. Uh, a life of addiction without any sort of relapse or any sort of mistake. Now, God knows I've had my fair share, more than my fair share. Um, and then this also serves as a reminder, not only to myself, but maybe to some other people that, you know, there's a certain amount of diligence in, in housework that needs to be done in order to stay sober. For most people, there are some people that can just you know, can just drop whatever it is that they're doing, turn their back on it, cold turkey it, and never have any issues. You know, I'm not that guy. I wish I was, but I ain't. And, you know, the meetings that I attended, you know, going to be, tr going to get treatment for my own personal issues. You know, uh, I, I have, you know, I have health insurance. I got health insurance for a reason about a month ago because the, well, the one thing of paramount importance was for me to take care of this. And one thing that I haven't done because I've been so busy, I just, I just have too many things to do. No, I haven't been too busy. I just haven't called. I haven't made the appointment. I don't know why. Maybe I'm just procrastinating. Maybe I'm scared of what I'm going to find out. I don't know. But I haven't done it. And, and there's a certain amount of maintenance in terms of going to meetings for me. Maybe meetings aren't for you. But I happen to like the community and fellowship in a, in, you know, in a good meeting. All meetings are different. You know, your mileage may vary. But, uh, but those, 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 sim those simple things, you know, I, I pretty much shut everything down at like 9 or 10 o'clock. That's it. I don't really go out late unless it's a very special occasion. There are lots of little things. I mean, I've been living, and the thing that kills me about this, and maybe, maybe this is part of my problem. I don't know. Give me some advice. I'll, I can use it. I've been living my life for the last five months like a, like a, like a Buddhist monk. Okay, I don't do anything. I mean, I, I work. You know, I, I watch a little bit of TV. I play some video games. I do a little bit of reading. And then that's it. I really don't go out. I mean, every once in a while, I'll catch a movie or kind of go out with some friends. I mean, I think I've been out with Joe as far as like outside of this place, what, maybe, maybe once or twice. I think I, I think I came over for a fight, the Conor McGregor Mayweather fight. And then, uh, and then that one time we went to the, uh, we went to a restaurant. 
you know, and, and so but here's the problem. Here's the problem. When you don't ever do anything, when you don't really like ever treat yourself, it, you know, and I've been saving diligently, <laughs> not for this, but that's what it was. Uh, Uh, you know, and we were even talking about this the other day that, you know, that you, every, you and I, for instance, have, are very similar in that we pretty much vent on a regular basis that, you know, it's like a steam engine, you know, you, the pressure builds up, you got to release it. Well, you know, I haven't really treated myself. I'll do that, you know, for my anger issues um, and staying on an even keel, but in terms of my addiction, you know, and, and sort of treat myself, taking care of myself, getting a few things here and there that I really want rather than depriving myself um, and treating treating my body, taking really taking care of my body. Not my physique, you know, that's fine, whatever. But really taking care of myself internally. Um, you know, that's I haven't done that. I haven't done the maintenance. I haven't done the maintenance. You haven't done the maintenance on the car, you don't get your timing belt changed. You don't get your, every 70,000 miles, you don't get your oil change every 3,000 miles. You don't get the tune-up every 100,000 miles. Guess what? Things are going to fall apart. And I haven't done the maintenance. You know, and that's what I got to do. I got to get back to doing the maintenance. I know there's going to be a lot of people who see this, who feel a certain kind of way about Yanni from this point. I hope that's not the case, though. You know, I took a chance on Yanni first bringing him on to After Prison Show. I took a chance on Big Dave, who we still don't know what's going on with him and I bear the brunt of the responsibility in that situation giving him the amount of money that I did and trusting him to do the right thing with it but I hope at least in Yanni's situation right now having the bravery and the courage to sit here and explain the things that he's been dealing with and the things that he's been doing I hope you guys will be willing to give him another chance just as I'm willing to give you another chance because I believe in you I believe in your capability and I know what you I know what you can do you got to do what you need to do though man whatever it is and if you're ever dealing with these situations the one thing that I told you on the phone earlier is why didn't you call me just call me say Joe I'm messing up bad you know and I, and I understand, you can't talk. I understand, you know, you're ashamed. I understand everything. But if you ever find yourself in this situation again, man, I hope to God, before you jump off of this fucking ledge, you will call me or you will talk to your mom or your dad or whoever you need to talk to right there in that moment to try to prevent this from happening. Because like I said earlier, you could have been dead. You could have been locked up. And it's just a blessing that neither one of those two things happened. As I wrap this up, I want you to tell everybody and, and tell me as well, you know, where do you go from here? Uh, well, you know, step one is, you know, step what one was this, was just being honest um, about what I've done where I was and I've done that with you and I've done that with the audience uh, now I need to do it with my parents I need to do it with my sister and I need to do it with my other friends um, so that's step two step three is is you know t today as soon as I get done with this video uh because I'm literally just hours from this, you know. I, I I wanted to call. I didn't. I wanted to call you, but it was like five thirty, uh, six o'clock, and I was like, ah, I know you're up early, but I didn't. I didn't want to call you that early, and I I actually uh, you know parked in a Walmart par parking lot while I was trying to like figure out, okay, how how am I going to approach this? What do I do next? And uh, and I actually fell asleep for about an hour. I saw Joey called at seven thirty. I called him at seven fifty. Um, so I say that to say this. Step two is I really need to take care of you know my mental my mental health. Um, I, I do I do I need that to supplement my own recovery. It's just something that I need to do. I need a it just works for me. I need a person that I can sort of I can say anything that I want to them 
They can give me an objective analysis, and there's nothing. There's it's completely private, um, and I don't ever have to worry about it. You know, being released or being judged, and so you know that's something about you know sort of psychological therapy. I mean, that's for me. You know, that may not be for, like I said, your mileage may vary. Uh, three, I'm going to have to carry my ass to some meetings. I mean, uh, that's just the bottom line, and I'm going to have to be honest with them. So, you know, I'll be white chipping it. Unfortunately, even though I have uh, a year and a half uh, sober, yeah, I have to pick up the white chip. I have to humble myself. That's that's really that's the other critical thing. Um, you know, I have to work on living arrangements if this if this doesn't go well with them. You know, that's that's going to be another step. I mean, I have to. Uh, yeah, I got to get back on task. I got to get back on schedule. I mean, for me, schedule and routine is everything. Once I deviate from that, once things change a little bit, you know, I don't. It takes me a little while to adapt. I don't know if that's just sort of like being institutionalized or if that's a facet of my personality. But I have got to. Uh, I got to stay on task and get all my routine. I got to nail that now. So, um, but again. You know, I don't have all the answers. And I apologize in advance if I've ever presented myself as someone who does. I probably have to a certain degree, especially considering, you know, in, in terms of drugs and alcohol. And if I gave anyone that impression, you know, I, let me, I'm letting you know right now that I apologize completely. Um, I'm sorry. With everything that's been going on over these last over this last day and a half or however long it's been since we wrapped up shooting with Big Dave on Tuesday, um, there's still a lot of answers that, rem there's still a lot of questions that remain unanswered. Where is Big Dave? What in the heck happened with him? And that's something that, you know, I hope to find out soon and I hope to be able to bring to all of you guys uh, as soon as I possibly can. Yanni, I'm going to be here for you to, if you need me, if I can do anything, if I can, uh, just anything at all. Uh, I'm going to do that. I felt like this was the first step that needed to be getting out of the way for Yanni to be as open and honest as he has been here because all of you do deserve to hear uh, what's been going on. We shot a video with Big Dave on Tuesday. I gave him $1,186, and obviously that was a major mistake. And I've probably made other mistakes as well. I've probably put you in toxic situations or volatile situations that have made it, uh, you know, little thoughts in your mind begin no. to fester. I, I just don't know. No. But I felt this was the first step that needed to be addressed and taken in an effort to move forward. Yanni, thank you for being honest. Thank you for your willingness to tell this to everybody. And from here, let's just try to make this right.